Welcome to the Tough Fish Show. I am so excited to bring to you Melissa Face. Melissa, thank you so much for joining the show. Thank you so much for having me. This is my week off here and I am, oh, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad. I you so, found so me glad. on a great day. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. Well, could we start by you sharing, how'd you get into writing? Sure. We have to go way back to have that conversation. I honestly don't remember not writing. It's always been my go-to. Like that's way before there was any publishing, any submitting for others to see. Um, even at the school level and competitions and all that I did there, but I've always written. I haven't always called myself a writer, but I have always written. Now, I like that delineation that you've made. Could you talk about when you embraced the calling yourself a writer then? Honestly, not that long ago. And mm -hmm. I have been writing for my entire life. I'm 42 and just had my first book published in September of 2020 and just recently got used to claiming that title. And you're right. There really is a distinction there. I don't know that all writers face it, but I think a lot of us do. There's a lot of imposter syndrome in writing and in the arts overall. And I really battled with like, is it okay to say that if I haven't checked this off of my writing goal sheet, or if I haven't published this kind of work, or if I haven't been featured in this magazine, because I did a lot of magazine writing initially. So I, I really did have a hard time with that. And it's so silly. Like nobody's going to come to you and challenge you calling yourself a writer and say like, what all have you done before you go calling yourself a writer lady? Like people don't do that. And I had to, to deal with my own like confidence and say, you know, this is what I do and I enjoy it. And there are some people who relate to it. Sometimes that's as good as it gets. And it's pretty wonderful. You know, I am so glad you shared what you just did because you're right. There is a form of imposter syndrome that can come up. And like part of what this podcast is really about is helping people overcome that, whether it's a speaking opportunity to actually be on the show as a guest. Sometimes it's actually, it's the listener recognizing somebody else understands and I, I'm dealing with this too. So how did you overcome or how, and it, overcome might not even be the right word, but how did you see it, address it, deal with it and move on so that it didn't keep you down. It, it, even when it comes back up at a new level, a new opportunity to recognize it, but how did you come through that recognizing it and addressing and moving on? Yeah, it's, it's not in the past, Jen. It's an ongoing thing for me. Yeah. And maybe there's somebody who's listening who says like, maybe she really should talk to a professional and, <laughs> and maybe, and maybe I should, and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that that is always a thought for some of us. Like you get asked to come and speak at an event and it's like, this might be it. This might be the time everybody realizes I have no idea what I'm talking about. And they just asked me to leave. <laughs> but I think that staying grounded is really important and continuing to work on the things that I love to do. And that's where my joy comes from. So if I'm feeling those like, uh, like a little intimidated, perhaps a little reluctant to go and do this thing that I've been invited to do, then I'll spend some time actually working on a project. And that gets me back into the zone of like, this is why I write. And this is what I love about it. And the sharing part can be really scary, but it's also critical in today's writing world. You cannot, I don't think, regardless of your route to publication, you can't hide anymore as a writer. And maybe like writers never should have hidden, like that's another issue in itself, but it used to be that they weren't responsible for as much of the marketing as authors are responsible for now. So it's, it's really hard to hide if you want to sell your book. Absolutely. Yeah. I totally agree with you that there are a few pieces in there that you just said that I want to hit on one of which is that when you said about when you're asked to do something you're speaking at a speaking engagement or what have you 
being on a podcast type of thing and saying, oh my gosh, is this the time they're going to find me out? (laughs) Try to reframe that even and say, this group is really going to, I'm going to have a great time with this group. They asked because they actually are interested and they believe I'll add value. And so I will add value. And so I'm going to have a great time and it's going to be a great experience just by reframing that. It really helps to shift your thinking going into a call like that, going into a speaking engagement. And then to your point about not hiding, you know, that's also part of getting out and speaking or getting out and doing interviews or getting out of book signing, those kind of things, because you got to put yourself out there. But if you look at it like you're sharing your work versus selling your work, mm-hmm. that frame, that, you know, that shift in looking at it also helps because you're excited. You created something you're super excited about. Exactly. You would want to share. It's, it's something exactly. you want to share. <laughs> yes. And other writers get that because I think many of us struggle. And another thing that I just thought about while you were speaking is, I wonder if I deal with it on another level because I write nonfiction, because I'm sharing so much of myself and my life and everything that I publish, everything that I do. Like it's, I'm opening up my my parenting views for criticism and for judgments. And I mean, that is, that's my platform right now. So I wonder if I wrote fiction, if that part wouldn't be as difficult. But then again, there are probably novelists and fiction writers who would say, nope, I deal with it too. It has nothing to do with your genre. That's right. Who knows, right? Who knows? Maybe, maybe somebody will tell us, right? That's exactly, (laughs) (laughs) that's exactly it. That it's, it's not about the genre, but to your point, because it's nonfiction and it is so personal, there is another piece of how, of what you're processing. So to that point, how do you decide what to share and what not to share? I think about that more now as my kids are getting older. And since I write primarily about them, I ask them, even my social media is comprised of a lot of quotes of little funny things, quirky things that my children have said, maybe things they pronounced incorrectly when they were younger, or just a funny line where I'm like, oh, I've got to use that. But now I'll ask them. I pulled them in yesterday while I was getting a few things organized and said, what do you think about this? Is it okay with you if I share it? So there's definitely more going into that now than when they were babies. And it's going to to continue like to be challenging, I think, because Evan's, Evan's 11. (laughs) I mean, it starts to get touchy. But I love that you've chosen to engage, to ask, you know, it's like, is this okay that I share this? Or is this okay if I post this picture of you or what have you, because you're showing the respect of them and they're also involving them. And that's kind of cool because they get to see, this is what mama's business is. What else are Mm -hmm. you, what else are you working on? Right. And they love that. And they love being part of it. They love to go to events. My son has read one of my essays at our library's poetry night before. It was the cutest thing. He stood up and read from my collection, a story about him referring to himself as baby Evan until he was past babyhood anyway, we'll say that much. But I thought like, how cool is that, that he embraces this? And he may be one of those kids that even when he's 18, he'll still be able to chuckle at some of the stuff. My daughter though. (laughs) Not so much. She's like, mama, what are you doing? (laughs) No, I will embarrass her just by my very existence. That's all that it will take, you know? Like, mom, I can't believe you picked me up from school. Like, (laughs) that's what (laughs) what parents do. (laughs) We have to pick you up. (laughs) So to your point, though, about sharing your parenting views, how do you discern or how how do you go about writing that so that it's connecting with your reader while honoring what your child needs in that space? Like how would you talk a little bit about that dance? Because I feel like there is one. I I think I'm understanding what you're asking, but let me know if it if it's not what you intended. Um because I write about moments and usually it's some sort of takeaway 
that either it was like an aha moment or something that took a little bit of time for me to realize like I wasn't doing this correctly and now I'm trying to do better, that sort of thing. So I think because people are seeing me on my journey and the things I mess up on, the things that have been successful, I think that part of it kind of helps with that dance. Absolutely. Yeah. And because there's something positive in, in what I'm sharing, not Absolutely. preachy, not like self-helpish in that respect, but just a positive takeaway. So it sounds, so to me, what that's saying is that you're really clear about who your target audience is and what they might need as they're picking up and reading your, mater- reading your pieces. Mm-hmm. They're, you're connecting with that person who might be saying, am I doing this right? Or am I the only one who feels this way? And it sounds like you really are clear about who your, who your reader is. Yes. And you probably were given the same advice I was when you started writing about show, don't tell, right? (laughs) Show, don't tell. So the more specific I am about an incident, a day in the life of motherhood, the more it resonates with someone else. And their day could be totally different, but because I was specific, they were able to connect to it. It's just, it's so amazing how that works. Like my bad day is not going to be the same as another mom's bad day, but we're going to have those same feelings and those same questions. So the way I lay it out and all of the particular incidents that I mention, it's just weird how that works, but it's also, it's amazing. And I'm not going to quote it correctly, but it's like, you write the specific and you connect with the universal. Do you know, do you know what I'm I'm attempting to say? (laughs) Yes. I love that. And, and it's so true. Like here I am in my little, little world in Prince George, Virginia. And I am sometimes able to connect with a mom who lives in Australia because I wrote about what it felt like to do everything wrong as a mom that day. And she was like, oh, I totally get this. I've had that day too. And that is a beautiful feeling. I totally agree. Would you talk about, I love you more than coffee? Sure. Well, (laughs) I cannot take credit for the title. I can tell you that much. The title came from my daughter. She was three and a half at the time. And she climbed up in my lap and she was just asking me, you know, like one of the 75 questions you get asked every few hours as a parent. And she was going through the lists. Do you like me more than candy? Do you like me more than cupcakes? I'm like, yes, Delaney, like you more. And then she went, what about coffee? Do you like me more than coffee? And I was like, you're not really going to ask me to decide, are you, between you and coffee? And that was hilarious to her that I was joking about it. And then I was like, oh, what a cute idea for an essay title. And that's what I wrote. I wrote about that horrific day where everything I tried failed. And I called it, I love you more than coffee. And then it became a little bigger than that. And I was like, what a great way to package an essay collection (laughs) on motherhood. And I reference coffee in my writing enough, not, not all the time, but enough that it made sense to have that theme. And I just put things together in chronological order, removed some essays that I thought the themes were a little repetitious and then started pitching it places. So that's how it became what it is today. I love that. That is so cool. Would you talk it too? (laughs) I love to talk about it. (laughs) Would you talk about the, the, the process and the path you went through for pitching? I I would love to hear more about that. Sure. I was really impatient. I can tell you that much. And I did not pitch many places. So the first yes that I got, I went for it. And it wasn't just like impatience, like I have to, I have to get this out there for any other goal, except my grandmother was aging and deteriorating. And I thought like, how cool would it be if she could see this come to fruition? Because she was one of my coffee buddies 
Like my grandmother would put on a pot of coffee when she knew I was driving to her house from my parents' house and she'd say, okay, well, um, call me when you're at the stoplight and I'll make sure I turn the pot on. And she and I would drink coffee from 10 p.m. until midnight watching Hallmark movies or Jag or wherever the attractive male was that she was following currently that she wanted to watch on TV. And I was with her, you know, like I was along for the ride having a blast. But she passed away before this book came out. And that was so crushing. And I know, like, probably a silly way, but it just, I wanted her to see it because she was my, my coffee buddy. And she was also one of the forces in my life who always said, when are you going to write a book? When are you going to write a book? I would show her something that I had contributed to. And she would say, well, I love this, but when are you going to write your own book? I'm like, oh, well, look, Mammy, I had this story published in Chicken Soup for the Soul. And she'd say, I love it. It's great. When are you going to write your own book? <laughs> so anyway, I have, I have her on my dedication page. I had to include a little line about her. I love all of that. I think that that was, that's just absolutely beautiful because first off my grandmother and I were really close like that too. So I love that she was such an encouraging such a positive force in your life, but mm -hmm. it doesn't sound silly to have wanted her to see it because, because of the closeness that you have, the, because of that, that love and that, I mean, all of that love went into this book and all of that love for your children, for, from her, that all went into this book. So of course exactly. you wanted to her to see this. Yeah. <laughs> of course. I just think that that's absolutely awesome. I think that's so, so cool. And I love that you had someone in your life in particular who was saying, when are you going to do this? When are you going to write this book? I see so much in you because that was the underlying message. I see so much potential. I see this. Your writing is powerful. Your writing is strong. You can do more with this. What are you going to do that's more with this? Like, so go write a book kind of thing. I, I think that that's invaluable. Do you have some thoughts about perhaps for someone who might not have nearly the support that you got to help encourage them. Sure. Um, create your support. If it's not somebody who's part of your family, then find a writing group, something at the library, something where you can join and find your people because that is important on the days when someone writes something snarky on your Goodreads page or <laughs> just life is bringing you down in general, like writers are sensitive souls and we need people who are in our corner and that's okay. And you know, like I have gotten better at letting people know when I need that. Like right now, I don't want to critique. I don't want you to tell me, just tell me why you like what I do. Tell me something good. I need to hear it real quick. <laughs> and if you don't have that already as part of your, your family dynamic, that's fine you can make it. And sometimes it's better when it's not a relative. Sometimes it is because there aren't the extra, the extra strings, the extra layers of a family issue that we all deal with. Sometimes it's better if it's a friend and a group that you've kind of cultivated as your own. Very true. And also if you have like an encouragement folder or like this was suggested in one of my previous guests podcast, but I mean, I do this too, where I keep a folder in my email, but you could have it on your desktop where every bit of like, you get a, a, a great review or you get an email that just makes your heart sing because you have touched them mm -hmm. or what have you create a folder that you can collect those things. And when you need that boost, you can go back and look at that too, to say, oh, wow, you know, this, this really did touch this person, especially when it's unsolicited. There's something really magical about that. So yeah, I love that to create that group, however that is. Absolutely. And there are books too. Sometimes you can get what you need without an actual person next to you. And Elizabeth Gilbert's Big Magic is a great place to go for the encouragement, for the artist's soul overall, for remembering why you do what you do, for not expecting too much of your art, whatever, whatever format that may be. 
but not expecting it to do too much for you by, by way of bill paying or financial success. It's just a really, really great read. And I've already read it three times. No kidding. <laughs> I only discovered it from a writing group that I'm part of. If you're out there, Julie Valerie, thank you. You're the first person who ever mentioned Big Magic to me. And I love, love, love it. And I read it now each time I go on my annual writing retreat. I read it again. Because it's That's just fun. that good for me. <laughs> so an annual writing retreat. Talk about that. Okay, well, I have only ever been to one location and it's called The Porches in Norwood, Virginia. And that is, okay, I'm a mom, I'm a full-time teacher, I freelance as well. So I carve out time each year where I know that for these three or four days, I'm doing nothing but writing. And I make that happen. And it's a wonderful, wonderful time. And I also do a lot of planning to go up to it because at first, the first time I did it, I thought, like, what if I've taken this time away from my kids and from home and I don't produce anything that's justifying my time away? And then I dismiss that once I read Big Magic and it's like, no, 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 I'm feeding my soul. Who cares about the finished product? This is something that I need to do for me. And I am ready now to like book my trip in June, into June, I'm going back, I can't wait. I love that because you're focused, there's an element of self-care that you're talking about where when you are taking care of yourself, whether it's that writer's community those folders that you, those emails that you hold on to because of the encouragement or just saying, I'm carving out this space and this time that's just for me. And it's not about the outcome as much as it's just about me doing something that's replenishing and nourishing and restorative for myself. Yes. You will have positive outcomes that come from that. And your writing improves and strengthens just because you've gotten you've gotten some mojo in there. You've got a little bit more, you know, you've done something for you. Mm -hmm. I save books that I'm excited about reading that perhaps I haven't had a chance to throughout the school year. So I'll take those with me. I take big magic. I take memoirs that I'm excited about since I write a lot of nonfiction. And then I write lists of ideas and topics, call outs for submissions, things that I would like to work on. But if I have a few days where I, well, not a few days, but if I have a day where I just drink wine and read, fine. Then that was my purpose for that day. And we'll just relabel it. Yeah. So, so it sounds like you also make sure that you read nonfiction, that you and yes. not just write it, but you also read in your genre. Do I you do. feel like, do you I feel try like, to. Do you feel like that helps with your writing as well? It helps a lot. Well, reading anything helps a lot, but I want to know what else is out there in nonfiction. And there are some beautiful nonfiction writers. So it, it feels like a treat to get to see what they're doing. Absolutely. Totally, totally agree with that. There was a, as you were talking about uh, Big Magic, a book that came to me that I see in this writing space as well, but also in business as well, because writers are also in a business and um, it's the war of art by Stephen Pressfield. And it's, that down. Uh, <laughs> it is a phenomenal book. It too, it talks about um, really a form of it, uh, resistance. And like when you're right, when you're kind of coming up against that and I liken that resistance to feel a form of imposter syndrome, but it can be whatever it is that's nagging at you that basically is saying, like, kind of, who do you think you are? Or who do you think is going to read this? Or who do you think is going to be interested in that type of thing? His, I felt like that book has done that, that similar reminder of, hey, keep going, you've got this. And it's such a, a, a great read too. It's an easy read, but it's a great read. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm laughing as you're talking about the imposter syndrome and the who's going to care because it's so funny, the things that will happen to you once you publish and your life is more public, things you would never expect. Like I, I promoted a post earlier this year to just 
share that my book had won an award. And I was really proud that, you know, like she went out there and won this little award. I shared the post. Somebody commented, keep your crap to yourself. Oh my. And I was like, you know, if I were in a not so good place, that probably would have stung a little, but I actually laughed at that one. And I was like, I can't believe that somebody was bothered and offended by my book post. <laughs> like, what does that say about you and your life? If that upset you that I was like, here's my, my little, my little independently published book, you know, and that that upset your day. Anyway, it's just, it's weird dealing with the things that people will say that people can comment on about something that is so personal to you that you have invested so much of yourself and your time, your energy, your emotions. And then somebody can just like knock it with just, but, but it's part of the game and I'm willing to play it so that I can see this through for the rest of my life because I'm exactly where I want to be doing exactly what I want to do and I mean hello that's why Taylor Swift wrote her song about haters right it happens to all of us and she took that negative mess and made a song about it that we all kind of jam out to now and it's just it's so true though my daughter asked me about that song the other day she's like what is she talking about about haters what does that mean what does that mean? Haters going to hate. And I said, anything that you do in life, there's going to be somebody who will find something wrong with it. And you have to get to a point where that doesn't bother you, or at least it doesn't change you doing what you do. I can't say it'll never bother you, but as long as it doesn't make you reroute, you're going to be all right. I love that. <laughs> That's powerful because you're right. So the first time you see a negative review that could get to you, or the first time you have, you know, you've posted something about an award and somebody makes a comment. Okay. You can make your comment, but that doesn't change what I feel. Don't let it dim your light. You did right. something so amazing. Don't let it dim your light. Keep actually shining your light. In fact, yeah. this is a good thing. Yeah, it was. And it's not like it was some prestigious award. It was just a little thing selected by readers and I was excited about it. And the people who matter were also excited about it. So that's what I kept in perspective. But I mean, in a way it was, it was humorous because the things that you think people might criticize are often not what you hear. It's something you couldn't have even imagined that they will find fault with. But it happens to everyone and it happens to bestsellers, to Newberry medal winners. Like it's, it's okay. Well, first off, I think it's cool that you won this award, especially <laughs> that you won an award from your readers. So because of readers, I think that's just a gorgeous thing. I agree. And, <laughs> so I would love for people to find out where can they connect with you and where can they find I love you more than coffee. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I would love for people to connect with me on social media. I share posts and funny little quotes about my children all the time. And I am on Facebook and Instagram at Melissa Face Rights. So I'm, I'm pretty easy to find both of those locations. I don't tweet. I have a Twitter, but you know, I can't even tell you what my handle is because I wasn't able to get the one that I wanted. So now I just never bother with it. Isn't that silly? Oh, well, that's what I do. And then my book is available, um, of course, on Amazon. And then if you want to support an indie bookstore, get it from Bookshop and yeah, you'll be able to find it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Melissa, for being Thank on the show. You. That was so much fun.